Hello, and welcome to Direct Approach with Wayne Moorhead, an exclusive podcast by Direct Selling News, where host Wayne interviews the channel's leading corporate executives to provide you timely insights and relevant takeaways to help you grow and evolve your businesses. In today's episode, Wayne is joined by John Addison, Chief Executive Officer of Addison Leadership Group and former co-CEO of the multi-billion dollar company, Primerica. John's story is a fascinating one. While working on his master's at Georgia State University, go dogs, John answered an ad in the paper for a job that began his 30-year journey. After joining Primerica in the 1980s, John advanced quickly at the booming company led by the legendary Art Williams. John helped navigate the company's expansion across North America. He became president in 1995 and was named co-CEO in 1999. Then he helped lead its exit from Citigroup in 2010. His passion for people and ability to develop and motivate individuals and organizations led him to launch the Addison Leadership Group in 2015. As a world-class speaker and motivator, John draws on his more than three decades of experience to provide insight and wisdom on leadership, personal development, and success. In this episode of Direct Approach, John shares why he thinks the world is experiencing a leadership crisis and what can be done about it. He also talks about the importance of helping others become their best selves and why focusing on building your strengths is better than trying to improve your weaknesses. He also shares why he believes fear is one of the greatest stumbling blocks to outstanding leadership. Then he shares some key takeaways so that leaders can help build stronger, more successful teams. This is an in-depth look at leadership from the inside that you do not want to miss. And speaking of leadership, learning, and growth, we invite you to join us in person for the annual DSN Global Celebration, known as the Oscars of Direct Selling, and the DSU Spring Event, Tuesday, April 18th through Thursday, April 20th, 2023, at the Omni Frisco Hotel in Frisco, Texas. You'll hear from some of the brightest leaders and experts in the channel to help you grow your organizations and your business. Before we begin, DSN is honored to be supported by industry suppliers that partner with companies across the channel to help enhance, streamline, and grow their businesses. This episode's sponsors are Nexio and Infotrax. Nexio was purpose-built to solve the payment problems direct sellers face. Their unified platform simplifies the complexity of the payments industry and helps you design forward-thinking strategies. Nexio empowers you to take control of commerce strategy, orchestrate payouts to distributors, optimize your transactions to grow your revenue, and maintain the flexibility to overcome obstacles in the ever-changing world of payments. Learn more at nex.io. That is N-E-X dot I-O. And when rapid growth or international expansion place demands on your business your systems aren't prepared to handle, success itself can be a potential cause of failure. As you grow, your system's requirements change, and nothing is worse than being hard-coded into a corner. The Infotrax platform was built with growth in mind, allowing the freedom to adjust your system at any time to align with your current business needs. Learn more at infotraxsys.com. That is I-N-F-O. T-R-A-X-S-Y-S dot com. Please help me welcome your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest, John Addison, CEO of Addison Leadership Group. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach Podcast. I am your host, Wayne Moorhead, and I'm very honored and excited today to be joined by an absolute living legend, um, a renaissance man. He is an author, he is a speaker, advisor, board member, operator, former co-CEO of a multi-billion dollar institution. I'm talking about none other than the CEO of Addison Leadership and former Primerica co-CEO, John Addison. John, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to be here with you, Wayne. I always always liked you a lot. I love being uh, being on here with you. Again, it really is an honor. And just from kind of the outset, I want to thank you um, for all you've done for the channel you know, over the years, for being an incredible mentor to so many, uh, including myself. I remember coming in you know, early in my career to the first DSU, even though it was called by a different name at that time, and was just absolutely blown away 
having the opportunity to hear from you, um, other legends like John Fleming, Jeff Olson. So I consider myself very lucky to have kind of come up through direct selling uh, at this time where there were people like you um, that were just so gracious with your time, with your insights. And so again, thank you for all you've done. You've had a big impact on my career, maybe more than you even realize. And I know that's true for so many people. Wow. So again, an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you, Wayne. Very kind. Well, you have an incredible story um, about your entrance into the direct selling channel and especially doing something that almost never happens anymore these days. You stayed with one company yep. uh, for your entire career. Do you mind talking us a little bit about the path that led okay. you into the channel and into Primerica? You know, it, in life, I've learned that um, any success you have requires discipline, requires hard work, but it also requires some luck. And um, so uh, Love Ann and I had just gotten married in um, May of 1982. And we're both working at that time. I'd met her at a, an insurance company that I was working at in downtown Atlanta. And we had moved out to the uh, kind of... Uh, eastern suburbs of Atlanta, and I was starting to work on my master's in business administration at Georgia State University. So I wanted to find a job that was closer to her apartment and made it easy for me to go to graduate school. So uh, I answered an ad in the Atlanta paper, uh, kind of in the fall of 82, that said rapidly growing insurance company looking for bright young college graduates to man new uh, newly opening home office. So I was young, I was a college graduate, bright, I didn't know some, I didn't know how much of that I had then. And so anyway, I went in and applied, went in for a couple of interviews um, and got hired as a business analyst at what was called Massachusetts Indemnity and Life Insurance Company. And it was the underwriter for A.O. Williams as the company was really taking off. Honestly, Wayne, I had no earthly idea that what the I knew the company did term life insurance. I had no idea about multi-level marketing. So I, I started working there and uh, was very fortunate that the company was growing rapidly and I got moved around to a lot of areas. Uh, first saw Art Williams speak probably around the end of that year and got caught up in kind of the culture and the movement and the company just exploded across the United States in the 1980s. I rose up uh, to like a vice president in the, uh, in the agency area of the business. Art sold the company in 1990, was gone shortly thereafter. And then it was kind of like, you want to talk about a culture shock, all of the people, because we were a very Southern company. Art was a college, foot, I mean, a high school football coach uh, from the state of Georgia, had a very strong culture. And then all of a sudden, the vast hordes from New York showed up um, and the company cratered. It went way down in the like 1990 and 1991. Sandy Weil, who wound up running City Group, Jamie Diamond, his young assistant and right hand person, who's now the pre the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase and one of the most influential business people in the country, a gentleman named Bob Lip, who now that I'm on the board of PPLSI, you know, used to be known as Legal Shield, uh, Bob is very involved in that business with one of the private equity firms, still acting, still state, but they came down to meet. And so Sandy said he wanted to have a meeting of kind of veterans who had been around the headquarters to just get their view of what was going on. And there were probably like 10 of us in the boardroom and uh, everybody was doing the, uh, you know, it's been tough, but things are looking better. Things are looking, I mean, everybody was trying to, you know, do this. 
And it got to me and I, you know, I was getting close to being done with my MBA and I was, and I finally said, you know, look, um, it, I don't know what company these guys are with, but you know, this thing is the Hindenburg at Lakehurst. I mean, Oh, the human (laughs) fire. And so I went through and they said, do you have any ideas? And I said, yeah, a few, but I'm not a genius, but I got a few of things I think we ought to do for the field. So the next day I got a phone call from Jamie Diamond and he said, I want to thank you for being the only honest person in the room. Bob Lip and I are going to come down next week and would like to meet with you and whoever you think should be there. So Rick Williams, who I knew very well, and Rick was the chief financial officer I, and wound up co-CEO with me. I got Rick and then a couple of other gentlemen uh, who were, you know, understood the compensation system, understood what was going on. And we met with them and we put together a restructured bonus system for the field. And fortunately, it, it worked. It stabilized the business and some things started happening and there was a little excitement created. So out of that, I kind of over the next three years rose pretty rapidly in the business, wound up a couple of years after that, being executive vice president of marketing and taking over all of that. The next year I was promoted to president and that was in 95. And Rick and I, for five years, I was the president running marketing. He was the chief financial officer and we kind of became anchors to windward. The CEO we had was very talented, but he broke a lot of eggs in the process of doing anything. He left at the end of 99 and uh, Sandy and Bob and group called Rick and I to New York and made us co-CEOs. And, um, and the fortunate thing is we had had, we forged a strong relationship and we had already kind of in our little notebook playbook, what we were going to do if we ever had the chance to take over. So we made some significant changes that were all very positive for the sales force. And, uh, over the next 18 months, we doubled. And so then we had a great run doing this, the fast version, a great run running the company from uh, beginning of 2000 to about 2006. And then the first cracks in that time, it was the best time we ever had. And then the cracks of the financial collapse of 07, 08 began to happen. And we knew we had, we, we knew Primerica did not fit in the new city group. Sandy was gone, Bob Lip was gone, all the people we knew. So then we spent uh, four years through the height of the financial collapse trying to get Primerica independent. Finally, through many starts and stops, got the company public in 2010, and it's been an incredibly uh, successful public company. So quite a journey. And the reality is, um, A, I was very loyal to the company. I loved the company. Okay. Still on the board. And, you know, maybe it was my mother praying so much and stuff, but just the good Lord found the right vehicle for me. I didn't know I could public speak. I knew I was a glib communicator and could always talk to people. Um, But in truth, for me, I found in an ad in the Atlanta paper in 1982, the right vehicle for me in life. And, uh, and I realize everybody's journey is different. Everybody has a different walk. Everybody, you know, sometimes, sometimes during those years, I was probably too stupid to quit and change jobs. Okay. Um, but for me, my path worked out for me, but I think for everybody, they've got to choose their path. Thank you for sharing that, John. It it certainly is such an incredible and inspiring story. And I did have the opportunity. The first time I heard the the full story was when I read your book. Actually, I think it was of kind of more of a manuscript pre pre publishing and uh, really inspired me. And so not only 
based on what you just said, do I think that you found the right company, but I also feel like the company found really the exact right person they needed at that time. Um, well, you know, it, it, on so many levels yeah. and you, you talked about getting it out from Citigroup and, and going public and, you know, it only took a few seconds to say those words, but it really was moving mountains. It was this Herculean effort that, that ultimately saved the company. It was the right move, but you had tremendous Wayne, headwinds. Wayne, they were Citigroup at one point because the world was collapsing and Citigroup Correct. was at the epicenter of the financial collapse. We were in the throes of knowing if we didn't rush into the building and pull the company out that, you know, the future. Uh, so it was, um, you know, I always tell people, you know, it's kind of like, I, I'm, you know, as you well know, I'm a huge Winston Churchill historic mm -hmm. buff. And, you know, when he became prime minister, you know, that he had wanted all his life, but finally at age 65, but in 1940, in the middle of the Blitz, uh, became prime minister. What he wrote in his diary was, I felt as if I was walking with destiny, that my whole life had been but a preparation for this moment and this challenge. And that's a little bit of what I felt during that time. When, when we went back to running the company as a normal business after that was done, there was an anticlimactic piece to that, you know, because, you know, you went back to dealing with, well, this guy in the field's upset about sure. oh, this person doesn't like the product now, this, you know, so it, I'll be honest with you, in some ways it was, as Rick and I've talked, you know, quite a few times then, since then, it was our finest hour. I mean, it mm -hmm. was what we were put there to do. One of my biggest advices to people, particularly people that run companies, direct sales companies, is look, you know, when in these businesses, the your product is people. You're telling people, believe in us, join this. And when that's what you're selling, you have a moral obligation to deliver. I mean, you know, if if you're just saying that to make some money, eh, you're a con man or, or a con woman. OK, mm -hmm. you're I mean, you're convincing people to bet on you. And so you have a moral obligation to fight like crazy to make your business be the best. For the, for the stakeholders, for the people doing it, that it possibly can be. Sometimes you can be going through what may seem like the worst time in your career, but if you fight through it and make and turn things around and make it happen, you'll look back on it as the most rewarding time in your career, okay? When you feel like, man, you know, I did something of significance, you know, and I, and I do, there was a, a book that I read one time that talked about going from success to significance. And, um, you know, I think that's critical. I agree as well. And, and I've had the same experience. I've mentioned a couple of times on the podcast, you know, I've been lucky to be part of some startups and, especially at those times, you know, it can be a grind. You don't have the resources, you don't have the timelines, but looking back, those were the most rewarding. That's when I learned some of the most valuable lessons. Um, and also from the example of others, watching the CEOs and the CFOs, again, brand, you know, brand new in my career, watching them roll up their sleeves and literally you know, help move packaging out of an 18-wheeler into the warehouse so that shipments can go out the next day or taking out the trash. I mean, their example to you me- You gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta do what you gotta do. And I, I love that you talked about that the product is really people. Um, and I, I think that that's something that, that you've really not just spoken about at events, but you've really helped to embody and, and to, to drive. And, and that's something that looking back, your track record and ability to grow companies is without question. It's incredible. But having you know had a, a front row seat a little bit to, to your career and been able to watch and learn from it, I think one of your other superpowers is growing people. Um, it is really developing and growing people at the field level, 
and at the individual level as well. And can you talk a little bit about the importance of personal development and where it fits in today's direct selling? At one of the things I, I always remember that Art Williams used to always say is um, he used to always tell people that were build, building businesses at A.O. Williams that you got to look at people and pretend everyone has a flashing neon sign on their chest that says, make me feel special, make me feel important. I want to be somebody. I was very fortunate to witness and, and I was so young then, I didn't even know. But to witness somebody who had a magical ability to bring out the best in people. Because I believe one of the keys is getting every, getting your team, getting the individuals to be the best them they can be. Because a lot of people want to, you know, a lot of people when they get into personal development, they start trying to be somebody else. Oh, if I could be just like Jeff Olson, well, not, there's one, okay? Or if I could be just like John Maxwell, and then there's one, okay? You're the only you that exists on this earth. And when you're dead, there won't be another you. You're unique. So you've got to find the talents in you. I always tell, I, I, I do a class uh, in leadership from time to time at the University of Georgia Business School. And one of the things I talk about is to find what you're good at without trying and then try like crazy. Most people spend their whole life working on their weaknesses. Okay. I'm not saying don't get better on your weaknesses, but we all have things that we are uniquely gifted at. Okay. And not, like, I've always been able to speak. Okay. I've always been able to, okay, throw a microphone at John and get him up. To say, and, and I can do that. And so I guarantee you, you could take a group of 10 people and they could work for a week on a talk and I could work for a little bit and get up and give a speech on it. And, I bet mine would be way up there on the for list. sure. Yeah, for sure. God smacked me on the head and said, this is a gift you got. Now, by the same token, I could go to the Juilliard school and, you know, practice singing with the great instructors in the world and would still sound horrible singing. Okay. <laughs> so I believe in personal development the, that number one, you've got to focus on you and what your strengths and weaknesses are and 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 have have some self actualization that most people aren't really good they're good at telling other people what they ought to do but they're not good at self actualizing themselves okay and then develop and work on yourself one of the things uh um, I, I'm not good at plugging stuff, but my John Addison leadership .com, um, uh, there I worked with some great young ladies. Um, I mean, Tess is amazing to work with. And we put together a thing called Mission Leadership, which is it's I mean, it's complimentary. It's not like you got to go on there and pay ninety nine bucks. It, 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 to, that is a lot of my leadership philosophy It's a course. Uh, to work on that, because I look, one of my themes in it is personal development for the rest of us. OK, because you see a lot of the people that are the personal development gurus and an average person sitting there looks up and goes, well, their teeth are perfect. Their hair is perfect. They look perfect. Their clothes are perfect. I mean, my God, you know, of course they're perfect. And that's in reality, that's not most people. Most people are human basket cases. I mean, we all have our bag of snakes that we're taking around with us. And I believe that the key is to work on getting better each day. I believe it's inch by inch, it's a cinch. Okay, you know, one of the things I always say that I'm sure I heard someone else say sometime, you know, all good sayings you have or something you heard somebody else say and you can't remember who it was, but that, you know, you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotten. 
to me, personal development is getting up every day, thinking about the right things, reading the right things, controlling who you give the keys to your brain to, okay, and moving forward. Hey, guess what? You can't change the past. I don't care how much you talk about it. You got to go forward. So I I think everything, and, and, and then it, Number one, you've got to work on yourself, and then you've got to develop the ability to, to help other people be the best they can be. One of the lessons, and, I, and this is something I remember Art talking about that I learned and utilized in my career. A lot of people, like if they're the quote-unquote boss, the only time they talk to people is usually to tell them what they did wrong. OK, well, I learned from him that. So if I was sitting down, so Wayne, if you were running marketing for me and we screwed up an incentive we announced or whatever, and I was going to sit down and talk to you about it, I would sit down and think about what I was going to talk about. And I would have three or four things where I'd say, Wayne, you know, you do an amazing job at this, that, the other. I would always have three or four things that that person does great and has done great and then go, but okay. And go into what needs to be corrected. Don't have them walking out going, you know, most people know when they screw up. Okay. But yeah. don't let them walk out going. The only thing he cares about is he doesn't care about all the good stuff I did. He just cares about what I messed up. One of the things in our world of technology and of, you know, having these things where everything is at the tip of our fingers, and particularly coming out of a global pandemic, there is a, I believe in some ways we are de-relationshipizing ourselves as a society. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Love that people can work remote. Love that we can do these things. But that's not the same as building a personal relationship with somebody. You can do business this way. You can communicate this way. I don't think you can build a culture and a team this way. And teams and cultures beat strategy every time. I, one of the things, Wayne, I tell the young people when I do the thing at the University of Georgia is they'll go into Q&A with me at the end of it. And I'll say, OK, this is about to be old man tough love. OK, OK. And I'll tell them, look, you're about to head up because these are the best. They're coming out with an MBA. They're the brightest. This is the top 1%. I mean, these people have jobs at Amazon, at Google, and all. I mean, and I always say, look, you're going out in the cold, cruel world. So one of my tips is when somebody asks you how you're doing and it's not your mother, they really don't care. They're just making conversation. OK, so always answer unbelievable covers it every way. It can be unbelievably crappy, unbelievably great. It's unbelievable. OK, and then focus on your what you got to do to get better. And the second thing I say is, look, I travel. I'm four million miler on Delta now. Always own them. If I'm in an airport, which I am a lot, will be next week again. Atlanta airport, busy as everything. Somebody under the age of 40, you know, business, young business person, just getting, got rocking and rolling there. Every time, whether I'm getting on the train or whatever, they got earbuds in and they're on this. Now, I'd like to think they're all doing some important business or whatever, but they're probably playing some screwy video game or you know, doing their fantasy team with their friends or whatever. And also some of the most important people that I met in my career completely by chance that were incredibly helpful when all of a sudden we were trying to get Primerica out of Citigroup was me having a drink and talking to a guy at the Sky, Delta Sky Club that ran investment banking for XYZ that I got a business card 
And then a few years later, I called and said, hey, look, let me tell you what I'm working on. Remember we met, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, I'll set up a meeting. You know, yeah. Those guys, me, making relationships is critical if you want to be a leader. Absolutely. There's so many great insights and so many things you said right there. I want to, I want to circle back to a couple, um, if that's okay. Yeah. You just mentioned, you know, bumping into the right people. It is incredible. I mean, you, you even talked or mentioned the word luck at the beginning, yeah. how that's part of all of our story, but you have to create a situation environment, a forum where luck can find you. Absolutely. You're right. If you're, if you're always closed off, if you're always distracted, then you can't have that level of serendipity in right. projects and you will meet in incredible people. I, I've found that as well. I think, I think that's really important. I know I get really guilty, especially in airports of kind of going in my bubble. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's a great reminder for me to make sure that I'm, I'm open yeah. and, and remaining open. Another thing you talked about was the importance of uh, making people, helping them to become their best selves. Yeah. And I do think that is such an incredible value proposition that we offer in direct selling where, of course, we have great products. You know, we have incredible products in this channel. If we're honest with each other, a consumer could probably find something maybe close, some other re replacement product. Mm -hmm. But what they could never find from those other companies is someone that cares about helping them become their best selves and helping them grow and develop as a person. And I love that you have spent so much of your career and energy focused on that. Um, and I know I've felt that, you know, in, in conversations, you know, initially meeting you, uh, with all the stuff that was on your plate at being, you know, co-CEO of a, a public company, it would be really easy to, to not be open, not be aware. But again, for me, you always included me. You made me feel seen, um, which again is a tribute to you. Another thing you talked about was finding what you're good at. I remember um, listening to a podcast about a week ago, and it actually made me think of you because I've, I've heard you say this before. Um, I think it was Scott Galloway. He's a professor at Stern, but he always says, you know, there's this idea of following your passion. You get this advice, go follow your passion. He said, don't, that's terrible advice. Don't follow your passion, follow what you're good at. Find that thing that you're good at, that you can do better than anybody else yeah. and, and go get even better so that you can become invaluable. I think, um, I think that's a really important lesson um, that you shared there as well. And you talked about how that really kind of transitions into leadership and helps inform, you know, as you get, um, you know, more skilled, as you grow, as you develop, you put yourself in, in more and more of a situation where you can lead. And I know that that's something that has also been a huge focus for you. You, you teach college courses on it. You have online courses and, and even your book, again, which I think everybody should go out and get is an incredible example of this. Can you talk about, we, we hear the, you know, the word leadership kind of almost thrown around maybe too much. And it's this big ethereal idea. Can you talk about what you see are some of the top skill sets that, that people need to develop to become the most effective leaders they can? I think yeah, that's a great point. And that was a great, you, you did a better job than me of a synopsis of uh, kind of those thoughts. And, and I, like I said, I do believe one of the most important things for people is find your skill set, find what you're good at. Okay. Um, the best you'll ever be at something you're weak at is mediocre. Leadership is critical. OK, I believe leadership is the scarcest resource we have on the planet right now. Great leaders bring people together, not tear people apart. Great leaders pull people of diverse opinions, diverse backgrounds together toward a common goal. I mean, I had a rule of thumb at Primerica, like if you were going to be a big speaker at one of our events, this is not your forum to get up and talk about your politics. I said, I've got political views. I write checks to people. I vote. I do things. But I never shared them with the people. I don't. It was not my job at Primerica was it to tell everybody everything I ever thought, everything I ever did. My job was to get the team to play at its highest level of effectiveness. 
Okay. And, and we have too many quote unquote leaders now who honestly, uh, you know, if they were doing this interview, they would, I'd say, Hey, Wayne, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? Okay. (laughs) I mean, leadership is about other people. Leadership is a verb, not a noun. And people need to, so one thing, you know, we talked, you mentioned in the thing recapping about, you know, luck, there, some football coach, I don't know which one said, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And so we all have these fears programmed into us. Right now, I'm working um, with Tess on a book um, called, um, that we're going to call Turn Your Fears Into Fuel. And we're about halfway through now. If I would work a little faster, we'd get through quicker. But um, but I believe turning your fears into fuel is critical. We all have these little demons that when we wake up at three o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep are telling us we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not pretty enough, we don't know enough, we're not prepared enough, all of those things. And, and, and your friends will give you more doubts and fears than anyone else. Yeah. And it is your ability. You, some of the most successful people I know are some of the most insecure people that I know. We all have these little demons and fears. You can't, you either, you, you got to feed your dreams and starve your fears. So you've got to fight through your fears. Okay, that's one key. And then the second thing to be a great leader is you got to learn to get along with a lot of different kinds of people. You got to learn to to walk in somebody else's shoes, know where they come from, be empathetic, not sympathetic, empathetic to other people. So that those are my kind of keys. Leadership, the world needs leaders worse than it ever has, in my opinion. Needs them in corporate, needs them in boardrooms, needs them in politics, needs them in so many things where we need leaders to step up and be the better person. You know, one of the lessons I learned in leadership now is, is I always, you got to be a great leader, in my opinion, is quick to apologize and quick to take blame. I watch a lot of people now, politicians are the worst. They always want to take credit for something that's going good. And when something isn't, it's everybody's fault but theirs. Okay. Well, the reality is when, when we would have a big primary trip, incentive trip, we'd have a thousand people, 2000 people at some gorgeous location. And I would know when I got up to talk to the group at the first of it, somebody's luggage got lost. Somebody's room got screwed up. Somebody's name was wrong on their check-in documents. There was that, I mean, there was some group out there that despite our best efforts, we had messed up. And I would get up and I'd say, first thing I want to do, I want to welcome you. And then the second thing I want to do is I want to apologize. I know there are some of you out there that despite our efforts, we screwed up something. Okay. I want to let you know we didn't do it to you on purpose. We didn't say, aha, Wayne Moorhead, let's make him feel awful today. And then I'd have everybody laughing and all of that. Yeah. You know, be true to your belief, be, be true to your principles. But on most of the stuff people get in fights and arguments over ain't important. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, let it go. You're the leader. Don't don't sit there. Some, I mean, some leaders, all they want to do is get in a fight with somebody. What I always wanted to do is go, here's where we need to get to. And for us to get there, I got to have this team of people all feeling good, playing at their best. And that's my job. My job isn't to make them believe everything I believe, do everything I do. It is to get them moving toward this goal. So anyway, I, I, 
at least I know that's what worked for me. Okay. Absolutely. You got to learn to push the buttons in people's heart. You win with your heart, not your head. Okay. And I wanted people that even if they didn't agree with me on a decision, that they didn't think, well, that jerk is doing this just to line (laughs) his own pocket or whatever, that they gave me the benefit of the doubt that I might disagree with him, but he's doing this for the right reason. Yeah. They know because of your character that you have good intentions. Yeah. Wherever the, wherever it lands. And I want to come back to uh, one thing you mentioned right there that I I wrote it down and I circled it like five times. You talked about leadership being a verb, not a noun. And I think that that really gets to, you don't need to have the title necessary to be a leader. And I think one of the biggest things that holds people back, and I know it did at my life, you know, multiple times and probably continues to is that fear of speaking up, that fear of possibly being wrong. Um, And so I think, really leaning into that, as you've mentioned, is really what helps create the leaders. It's not your title, it's your actions and just go out and lead. You, you don't need an invitation. Well, see, Wayne, I think that, honestly, I'm glad you focused on that and mentioned that because I think that's one of the most important things that, look, when I became a lead, the company was going through very challenging times. After Art was gone, the founder, the heart, the soul, everything was gone. And there were a lot of people way above me that had much bigger titles than mine. But then I would be in meetings with group where I just go. Now, let me tell you what, when, when you're not the boss, okay, which is different than being the leader, When you're not the boss and you're in the room, some people, you can just, sometimes some people that have the right idea, smart, brilliant, all that, but they're such a jerk that no one ever listens to them. I believe the greatest ability is likability, okay, where people like you and are willing to listen to you because of that, because you're not a jerk. So I don't mean show up at a meeting and go, oh, you idiots. If you'd listen to me, we'd fix this crap, okay? But, But learning to have leadership by influence, not title, okay? Because if you get great at that, John's career, only one I can speak to, By being great at leadership by influence, I ultimately wound up with the title. So the ability, now it takes a different skill. It takes more skill when you're leading by, when you got the title, hey, you got the platform. When you don't have the title in the position, I mean, you got to be better, okay? But I got really good at getting people to go, you know, he's right. And so finally, one day, one of the guys that was running the company said, hell, everybody keeps saying you're the one that has the answer. Hell, we can make you, you know, executive VP of marketing. That is a critical thing. Just title does not equal leader. Okay. Sometimes the people with the title are the worst leaders in the company. And um, so, yeah, that's an incredibly important point, Wayne, an incredibly important. Thank you for that. That's really, really insightful. So I want to take a little bit of this and, and maybe kind of put it into application uh, for a second here as, as we start wrapping up. Sure. You talked about leadership being one of the scarcest resources. And I think that is so true. And regardless of, of company, category, channel, we need leadership right now. Things are changing so quickly, more quickly than they ever have. Okay. So w- with that context there, what advice would you give to a brand new direct selling CEO that's just coming into that position during this time of change, what do they need to be doing? What type of leadership do they need to be expressing to make sure that their company and all of our companies continue to have success and relevance going forward in today's direct selling? One thing is you gotta be a team builder, okay? I mean, um, you gotta be a team builder. You got to be somebody that is great. You got to get great at building a team and picking the right people to be on your team. 
But I wanted people who would disagree with me, would, you know, respectfully, but, you know, I didn't want a bunch of people. I didn't want to, you know, go to a meeting and it turned into a fist fight. But, you know, I wanted people that would, you know, say, John, in my opinion, but that's not smart. So you want to get people around you who are better than you. Find people, look, know what you're good at, know your strengths, and then surround yourself with people who are good at what you're not good at. Okay, some people like me, I didn't need my right-hand person to be a great speaker. Right. Okay? I needed my right-hand person to be a person that made the train run on time and, you know, made the details happen. I, you know, you know, it was Rick and I, but then I had Chess Britt who, I mean, and Chess was one of the wisest. And I had people that made me better, okay, because their skill set wasn't my skill set and my skill set wasn't their skill set. OK, so you've got to surround yourself with people like that, where the team, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts on their own. Um, the second thing I would say is you got to listen a lot. This the world's changing. I mean, you know, and you, you're you not going to stop change. I, you know, there's things I wish, I mean, I'm about one or two technological advancements on these things from getting one of the jitterbug phones, okay? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm tired of learning new things on, on there or whatever. But, it, you know, it, I mean, you're not going to stop change. You know, being the old man on the yacht, you know, saying, get off my lawn, okay? You right. Know, it's, that ain't going to work. Okay. So you're either going to be a victim of change or a victor over change. And so you need, I mean, so like if I was starting a company now at my age, the first thing I'd do is I'd go, I better have a bunch of damn smart young people around me. Okay. I better, you know, I don't need to get my old herd, you know, from back in the day, you know, that boy, didn't we kick butt in the nineties and the early two? I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta, so <laughs> surround yourself with the right people. Okay. Learn to listen, learn to, you know, to expand your thinking uh, and just work your tail off every day on getting up and saying, did I make people feel better today because they were around me or did I make them feel worse? One of the guys that ran our company back in the nineties and I was moving, I was way up in the organization, but he would fly in every week from New York and the company ran based upon what kind of mood he was in. So, you know, and so I had to meet with him at seven o'clock AM every Monday where we'd talk about the week. And when I would come out of his office, all the other executives would start grabbing me. What kind of mood's he in? Good mood? <laughs> what kind of mood? Okay. Look, yeah. you, you got to get up every day and say, regardless of how I feel today, whether or not I had a fight with my husband or wife, whatever, that I'm going in and I'm going to make people feel better and be better just cause I walked in their office today. I'd be my advice. That is such incredible um, insights and advice to give. You've been through it. Speaking of getting the right people, you, you mentioned Rick, you, you were both such an incredible, successful, formidable team. Yeah. Um, again, I learned so much from, from watching and interacting with both of you. And I know the whole channel has, and, and John, I just want to thank you again for being so gracious with your time, with your insights, with sharing it, not just here, but everywhere you do, whether it's at the board level. I know, not that I want your phone to start ringing and give you more work, but I know that people call you, they, they need your advice. You've yeah. been so generous Don't with worry, your time. I, love, I do love doing that. Uh, it's probably, it's, it's actually been interesting, Wayne, as, as I transitioned out of being CEO and decided I was going to rewire, not retire, but I wanted to have big hat, no cattle. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I've found as much as I enjoy, and I would love, I mean, like I said, John Addison leadership.com. I'd love to, you know, come speak at your organization, those kind of things. I love doing that. But as much as I love that, the thing I found the most rewarding is um, is the advice and consulting and stuff I do with the companies I work with. And I enjoy going in and my approach is, hey, look, you know, you guys run the company. All I can do is I'm going to talk to you today or work with you as if, it was my decision to make. That's how I know how to do things. I was a CEO. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, I'm not a professional consultant. I ran a big company with a huge sales force. And my approach is, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you my opinion. Okay. I'm going to sit and look at where you're at, look at your numbers, look at what your comp system's doing, look at what your business is doing. And I'm going to say, hey, if I was sitting in your chair, here's how I'd be thinking. And so, uh, you know, like I said, it's got all of my, if someone goes to johnaddisonleadership.com, it's got all the contact and stuff. I enjoy doing that. I, um, uh, it, it's probably my most rewarding thing It's where, cause I still, ha- I have a, I have a high need to feel like I'm making a difference. <laughs> I, I, I don't like golf that much. OK, <laughs> so just getting up every day going, OK, what course am I playing? Eh, that really doesn't do it for me. So um, anyway, so it was an honor yeah. to do this with you, buddy. Thank so. you. Will you will you will you have and continue to make an impact on so many people, John? And I, I encourage anyone to reach out to you. Thank you for sharing um, the URL. There's no one that's operated uh, at this channel at the at the levels that that you have. Um, and so your your advice, your insight, your wisdom is just completely invaluable. And again, I loved Real Leadership. I read it a few times, and I can't wait for the next book. Um, when does when does the new book come you know, out? I, I would think so. the The new version of Real Leadership should be out there within the next two or three weeks on Amazon. Right. So, and then probably I would look for turn your fears into fuel. You know, it, I'll be announcing it probably sometime middle of uh, twenty three. That is a topic I feel very strong about, strongly about because the imposter complex, not thinking you're good enough. Sure. Okay. Man, that can, that holds people back like crazy. So. It does. It does. I again, I know. I've. I think probably we've all felt it at times. I remember reading an article where they were saying about seventy percent of people actually feel it, and most of those people are high achievers because you're, you're out. You're out doing things you've never done before. You're stepping out into the unknown, um, and so I can't wait to read that book because I, I probably need it more than anybody. All right. I'm looking forward to it, John. All right, my friend. It was good. Thank talking. you so much. See you, man. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Good talking to you, Wayne. Thank you for tuning in. We invite you to subscribe so that you are the first to know when new episodes are available. And save the dates now for the next DSU event, which is an in-person only event and the annual DSN Global Celebration taking place April 18th through April 20th, 2023 in Frisco, Texas. Registration will be open soon. Save the dates for now. Thank you for listening and supporting DSN and the Direct Approach Podcast.